Hello and welcome to the Marsh Stream, your solo performance broadcasting platform. I'm Kristen Scheel, Development Associate for the Marsh. Greetings also to our YouTube viewers and welcome to Monday night, uh, sorry, welcome to Solo Arts Heal with Gail Shickley. Since April, the Marsh has been bringing you free programming nearly every night of the week. We hope you will subscribe to our YouTube channel the Marsh Stream to be notified when our shows are going live and catch up on things you may have missed at our website archives at www.themarsh.org. We'll be posting the link to our virtual tip jar in the chat throughout the evening. And if you are a regular Marsh viewer, we hope you will consider becoming a sustaining member. We hope you'll join us tomorrow for the first International Solo Fest Awards on Stephanie's Marsh Stream. That's tomorrow night at 7.30. Um, Friday, we will have Fitness Sing with Candace Johnson at noon and followed by a new game night with Don Reed. Uh, that's also at 7.30 on the Marsh Stream. I am going to turn this night over to Gail Shickley in a moment, but please, uh, we've been providing this um, free programming every night of the week uh, since April. So we hope you'll visit our tip jar and also consider um, becoming a subscriber of our YouTube channel and a sustaining member. Um, but here we go. We're looking forward to tonight's show with uh, Rob G joining us from the UK. Thanks. Turning it over to you, Gail. Um, thank you to Kristen and Brianna and thanks to the Marsh for offering community service uh, with nightly entertainment inspired by 30 years as the breeding ground for new performance. Um, the Marsh Stream just finished its first virtual international solo festival with 56 shows from seven countries. So I'm, I'm still watching the shows through Sunday and the audience can too, sign up. It's not much at all. It is so worth it. Support the arts. I so much look forward to the awards tomorrow also. Um, do we have Rob? Um, uh, we do. I'm asking him to rejoin as a panelist because somehow he got bounced into the, um, the audience. Uh -huh. So here he is. So hopefully you can. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to. Start I'm here. your video. I'm, uh, can you start your video? Yes, I'm just starting. Here I am. Here's yeah. me. Uh, uh, lovely, it's, lovely. It's, it's, it's nervous there. Sorry. Rob, <laughs> great. Wonderful to have you here. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have Rob G joining us live from the UK where it's 3.30 in the morning. So we're so grateful. So let me just um, give an overall welcome to everyone to Solo Arts Heal um, today, of course, um, featuring tonight Rob G. And he's going to join us shortly with excerpts from his show, Forget Me Not, an Alzheimer's Who Done It. Um, but let me tell you first about Solo Arts Heal. Um, in January 2020, we began an artist collective of mostly solo artists that shared the theme of the healing power of the arts. Thanks to Stephanie Wiseman and the Marsh Theatres, this blossomed into Solo Arts Heal on the Marsh Stream. And a, this is a collective of independent theater and musical solo show artists whose performances are united by a common theme of healing from a variety of physical, mental, and emotional challenges. And as if life isn't challenging enough, we now have during the pandemic a dramatic rise in domestic and sexual violence, depression, homicide, suicide, just some of the topics we've been covering during this pandemic and with these wonderful shows. And as we find ourselves in the perfect storm of pandemic politics and climate, need I remind you, vote and that art heals. Look around you, arts are everywhere and available for your contemplation and enjoyment. Here on Solo Arts Heal, we present performance excerpts and talkbacks with audiences, but full performances of these shows are developed to work in settings from theaters to medical centers, universities, community nonprofits, and, and other environments. Solo Arts Heal is a theater of resilience, born from artists' true stories that celebrate overcoming adversity performance and informants on health and wellness related issues, including the health crisis of climate change and what we can do about it. Here we celebrate education and inspiration for your empowerment with artists at the forefront of advocacy, creativity and social change. Solo Arts Heal embraces the power of community and the healing power of the arts. Tonight, this couldn't be better, better illustrated and celebrated than in the world of poet, comic, and psych 
psychiatric nurse, Rob G. Let me introduce you to him. Rob G. qualified as a mental health nurse in 1994 and worked for 12 years in mental health units around the UK and Australia before becoming a stand-up poet. He's performed at 100 fringe festivals across the world and won numerous poetry slams, including the Edinburgh Slam, BBC's Why Poetry Matters Slam, the Sydney Poetry Slam, and the Orlando Poetry Smackdown. He's received over 20 awards for his solo shows and regularly appears on BBC Radio. He returned to nursing at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. So now, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming with excerpts from his show, Forget Me Not, and Alzheimer's Who Done It, and from his healthcare training sessions, live from the UK, Rob G. Hello, everyone. Hi. Um, thank you for, for joining me. Um, to start with, I'll let you know, I'm not always this pale or green. It's something about the lighting here at this time. Um, it's also, it's quite early in the morning at my end. Um, if, if I do fall asleep halfway through, then uh, uh, apologies for that. Um, so my name's Rob, hello. Um, um, I've got a show, The Alzheimer's Who Done It. And what we're going to do, I'm going to give you some extracts from the show. We're actually using it, uh, the National Health Service in the UK, we're using this show to train healthcare staff in ethics and reporting concerns. Uh, what, what we used to call whistleblowing uh, over here, but it, it's that. Um, and so I'll give you some extracts from the show. Uh, we'll talk a bit about how the, the training works and what it looks like. Uh, I'll give you a few of the, the, the figures that have come from the training uh, and then there'll be, a, we'll, there'll be Q and A uh, at the end. So uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Um, so I think to, to start off with, I'll give you the opening salvo uh, from from the show. So what you need to know is that um, forget me not. It's essentially it's a murder mystery. It normally lasts for an hour, uh, and of course with the, the, the sort of the, the twenty minute segment, you can't really do that with a murder mystery because there's so much infrastructure of plot to get in. So I'll give you the first four minutes. Um, normally I play fifteen characters who deliver a variety of plot flaws, tropes, red herrings, and all the rest of it. Uh, the first character we meet. Um, is Elsie, who is uh, in her 80s, and this is, uh, and this is her. To whom it may concern, I've never been known for my attention span. In fact, my husband thinks I'm gormless, but I am losing my memory one story at a time. And at the moment, I'm getting away with it in a forgetful kind of way. I'm trying to keep things to the front of my mind and I've only left the gas on a couple of times so far that I'm aware of today. Now, it just so happens I spent a good chunk of my life working as a nurse in dementia care. So although I have no idea where it is my mind is going, I'm under no illusion as to what's waiting when it gets there. So I thought I'd better write this letter for later on in my dementia. And if you're the sorry sod who's reading it, then my arse is your career. I have half a sugar in my tea and I am very partial to custard. I can't abide fisherman's pie especially when it's pre-digested. You can swear in front of me and I probably won't mind. Don't worry if you're careless now and again, as long as you're gentle and kind. You can even take the piss a little if you like, because I will be giving you plenty of mine. But don't treat me like an embarrassment, even when I'm embarrassing. Just keep me nicely medicated and clap your hands if you see me singing. Please don't manhandle me unless I hit you first. Try and make sure I have clothes that fit me and don't worry about being a brilliant nurse. Just give me a lie in now and again. And if I filled my nappy but I appear quite happy, Change the other people first. And please be gentle with my husband, 
We have been married since 1963 and every pore in his body is going to want to stay with me. And although he will be full of anger and pride, he'll be quietly going to pieces inside. So try and involve him as much as you can because he does do his best and he's only a man. So thanks in advance for all your hard work and dedication. I hope I can make you smile as my senses slide and I hope that I am a model patient. I am aware the fact I will lose my memory won't stop me feeling things emotionally. So smile a lot and have fun and lie to me. And when I finally lose it all, please give me somewhere soft to fall so I can decompose with a modicum of dignity. And if you have an ounce of compassion, try and slip me the occasional whiskey. I think that completes the briefing. I wish you well in all you do. And if ever you're in my situation, I hope someone does the same for you. There you go, so that's Elsie, yeah. Um, anyway, she gets murdered. And, uh, and the whole point of the show is that Jim, Elsie's husband, he's, um, he's, you know, El his wife, Elsie, is, uh, dies on a dementia ward for what appears to be natural causes. Um, uh, Jim is a retired police detective and he smells a rat. Um, and so he's determined to investigate one last murder. Uh, the problem is that Jim also has dementia. Uh, so it, it's, it's a case worthy of the finest detective mind, but his will have to do. Um, and so uh, I'll tell you a bit about my background before I tell you about how we, we use this to train healthcare staff. Um, so I, I was a uh, as Gail mentioned, I was a mental health nurse um, and I worked mainly um, in, in adult mental health for, for 12 years. Um, I then became uh, half of a double act on the comedy circuit, did the clubs for five years and that was great. Um, and now I do stand-up poetry, uh, which it's, it's sort of like slam poetry, but it's, it, it's sort of like stand-up comedy really, but it rhymes and there's no jokes in it. Um, and much of my income was touring international fringe festivals. So you, you get in the habit of writing a new hour long show every year, really. Um, and I wrote Forget Me Not because um, we'd had in the UK, um, we had some, um, we had a thing called the Francis Report, which happened in the wake of a scandal that came out of a, a National Health Service Trust in Mid Staffordshire. Um, where they had an alarming number of fatalities due to neglect. Um, and this report highlighted the fact that lots of people knew that this was going on and no one reported it. Um, and what was particularly troubling was that the few people who did report it were either sidelined or moved on. And so the Francis report, um, one of the recommendations was that the, the health service over here has a much more transparent culture and that whistleblowers are supported and that people are supported in raising concerns. And when all this came out, I'd, as an artist, I, I, I really love murder mysteries. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of crime fiction. So as a solo performer, I, I'd, I'd long you know, set myself the challenge of, can I, can I execute a, a murder mystery, you know, a one-man murder mystery where I play all the characters and, and, and will it actually stack up? And when I started writing it, I realised that for a murder mystery to work, you really need a closed environment. You need a, you need a castle or a train or an island, you know, so as to limit your, your pool of suspects. And I thought, what better than a dodgy elderly uh, dementia ward, curiously similar to a place where I worked as a student nurse, as a, as a young student nurse in the mid nineties. And this particular ward is what they called, a, a, back then they called it a challenging behaviour ward. So you've got 30 patients, four members of staff per shift. Uh, um, uh, quite a few of the, the, the patients were ex-boxers uh, as well. And, um, and I actually left under a cloud after reporting some of the conduct that I'd seen on this ward uh, when I was a student nurse. And at the time, again, similar to many people's experience, I'd, I'd reported what I'd seen, which was pretty unpleasant behaviour. And, and, and I've been, um, and 
you know, nothing happened and no one spoke to me for the rest of my placement. Um, I, I was inconsolable. Um, but the reason I wanted to write the show was that I realised that I, I was there for three months as a student nurse. And then I spent 12 years working on the acute wards in psychiatry. And I, I was assaulted more in that three months than in the entire 12 years of, of my, my nursing career. And, and I realised, and what I, what I think I realised at the time, um, working in this environment, was that very few people join nursing because they're sadists. And the, the vast majority of the people that were displaying this kind of behaviour were people that had slow, there'd been a sort of slow, insidious process of moral erosion. Um, and I also felt it was about as hard as, as, a, as a nursing job could get would be to nurse people with late stage dementia who exhibited what we, we referred to as challenging behaviour because, because it was quite a thankless occupation. It was physically demanding um, and, and it just weren't the numbers. It was, it was quite, you know, it was quite knackering really. Um, <clears throat> and so when these stories came out about this woeful treatment in, in care establishments, not just for people with dementia, but also people with learning difficulties. I wanted to add to the conversation, and it, this is the time I was writing the murder mystery, and thus Forget Me Not was born. Um, I had no intention of using it for training, I was just touring the show and, and having fun doing it. Um, and it was, it was the healthcare service, it was the NHS in the UK who approached me and said, actually, this, is, this could be really helpful for us. Um, and so, and so we, the training was born. And so what happens, this is what the training looks like is that you get a load, we, we deliberately target healthcare managers and clinical staff, because often there is a bit of a divide between the people that run the service and the people that deliver the service. And we wanted to bring everyone together to sort of talk openly about, about the problems that we're facing and about some of their experiences. So, so in terms of who we target, it's as wide a, a variety of healthcare staff as possible. So in the room, you, you'll, you know, you'll get a couple of consultant psychiatrists. You'll also get um, healthcare support workers, you know, unqualified nursing staff. You'll get student nurses, you'll, you, you'll get occupation, you'll get the whole gamut of people. And then what happens is I do the show uh, for an hour. Um, again, which is, it, it's a bit like doing a Zoom performance in a way, you know, when you're used to doing a theatre show with lights and sound and all this production to make it look great. And then you're in a, a, a seminar room or a conference room. So you, you really are falling back on the writing. Um, so I do the show uh, for an hour and then lead these breakout conversations, sort of roundtable discussions. A lot of it are based on, you know, what would you do? Um, and um, so, for example, one of the first questions that I ask is that Elsie's, you know, Elsie is a retired nurse with early stage dementia. And, and the first part of the show is, is Elsie's letter saying what she wants her care to look like. And, um, and I wrote it as a performer, because if you're going to make loads of jokes about mental health or dementia or, or things that uh, you, you really need to set your stall out first. So people, you know, it's not the, the, the subject that makes a joke offensive, it's the intent. So it was important. So I wrote Elsie's letter because I wanted the audience to know what my intent was or where I was coming from on dementia. But my question to the healthcare staff in the training is, what would your letter look like? Um, and so it, from immediately you, you, you try to get people to, um, to empathise with, with the clientele. And what was really interesting with asking that question, you know, Elsie's written this letter, what would your letter look like? Is that you'd find a lot of more experienced, particularly experienced nurses, would answer that question by going, oh, well, what people would want is this, what people would like is that. And you go, no, 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 I'm not, I want to know what you, what you would want to. And even that simple task would be quite difficult. And then some of the questions are quite sublime, you know, like, um, without too much of a spoiler, like, uh, you know, so-and-so was being bullied, you know, if you were so-and-so, what alternative to murder might be open to you? And, and things like that. Um, there is a question in there about, there's a subplot, in the show where um, a nursing assistant is pretty convinced that the ward manager is stealing from, from the patients. Um, and so one question is, you know, what should she do about the fact that, you know, what, what should she do about the fact that she thinks her boss is stealing from patients? And so we all have a good chat about that and what people should do about it, who they can report it to and all this. But the next question is, what stops her? Um, and what you're doing there with the training is teasing out all, um, 
all the reasons that people don't report troubling behaviour on um, in healthcare settings and by troubling behaviour I'm talking about the whole wide variety of everything from you know you're worried that a nurse isn't washing the hands properly after using the the, the washroom to uh, to full-on physical abuse or stealing and and it's about what what it is that stops us doing these things um a lot of the a lot of the reasons given were about often quite a realistic perception that people will be ostracized or sidelined or seen as a troublemaker um and the, the national health service really want to address that now so again you, you, you you're teasing that out to essentially to reassure people and what's quite nice is that there'll be there'll often be someone in the room who's had quite a recent experience of doing it and can say well actually it, it went okay um the other reason that people give for not reporting stuff is what if i'm wrong you know what if i suspect this but it's not actually happening and, and at which point you say well it's not your job to investigate it's simply your job to raise attention to it there's the internal uh, the sort of faux morality of not being a snitch which um which actually has no place in healthcare whatsoever you know unless you've got your patients back you really shouldn't be putting on your uniform in the first place as far as I can see. And so we tease out all these different, um, all these different things. Um, and in a moment, what I'm gonna do is, I'm aware it's, I'll give you a bit of the show as well. So I'm gonna take you through some of the characters. Uh, and, then, and then we'll talk um, a little bit about, um, about the, the results from the training and, and what we found. Um, so basically in terms, of, um, in terms of who, it's also worth saying as well that the show is set in the mid 1990s and the reason for that apart from that was my own experience of dementia care is that i didn't want anyone to feel targeted or blamed for what was being depicted in the show i wanted it to have the, the safety of time um if you know what i mean uh, but there's some fairly jolly characters in it so um so first of all we have percy's wife um she doesn't visit very often i've known him 60 years and he hasn't interested me once. We have Janet, the ward manager. Well, it was documented quite clearly that she was not for resuscitation. So, leaving aside the fact she's dead, I really don't see a problem. Yeah, she, she's not very nice. She gets murdered as well, pleased to say. Um, uh, the, there's Jim, he's, he's the, the widower. Um, Who's, who's investigating what his wife's death, uh, and he he also has has dementia. Um, I don't think I'm the kind of person that would kill a ward manager, but if I did, I'd have to have been extremely devious, because I would have known it would be me wanting to talk about it later. Uh, yeah. uh, then we have Timothy. Uh, he's he's one of the nurses. Um, so I finally got to see the Siberian chiff chaff when it was spotted near the sewage works in Bobbington. I was I was particularly pleased. I've never seen one before, yet alone in such intimate circumstances. It's the happiest I've felt since the neighbour's cat died. <laughs> um, he is also a suspect. Um, there's um, Dean, one of his colleagues. No, no, Timothy is not the kind of person that would murder someone. Although, to be fair, he's 40 and he does live with his mum, so he probably has a murderer's profile. Um, there's several patients involved. One of them is Molly, who's lovely. All day, all day, all day, all day. And I'll let Dean tell you about Molly. Oh, lovely Molly. It's been a very long time since she fell off her trolley. She used to be dead posh. Like when she first came in, all she ever said was, are you here all day, darling? And you'd go, yeah. And she'd go, marvellous. And then five minutes later, she'd say it again. She'd go, are you here all day, darling? Marvellous. She was so happy. She'd say it to everyone all day long. Darling? Are you here all day? All day? Marvellous. That was a few years ago and now it's all gone. All that's left now is just all day, all day, all day. And then um, within the show, we wanted to get as many who'd done it tropes in as, as, as possible. Um, and of course, one trope 
within the murder mystery genre is that your police detective has to be a bit stupider and more pompous than the civilian who's actually investigating the murder. So you, whoever Miss Marple investigates always has a, the police with his breathing down the neck and telling it to clear out the crime scene. Same with murder, she wrote quite often. Um, also diagnosis murder, you know, Dick Van Dyke is the smartest detective in the whole, the whole deal. He's smarter than his son, you know. Um, Holmes, um, uh, Sherlock Holmes as Inspector Lestrade, who's completely clueless. And so in that tradition, it's, uh, I'm delighted to introduce you to uh, Detective Inspector Ray. And he's great. Everything he says is a mixed metaphor. We need to, uh, sit down and walk through a few things. I'm going to stick my neck out on a limb and cut straight to the wild goose chase. Now, rest assured, my mind is currently an open slate. Now, as an ex-detective chief inspector, it appears you have a chip of the old block on your shoulder and you've spent the whole evening poking around. Well, now the foot's on the other hand and I hate to be a spanner in the ointment, but I need to ask you to leave off because we don't want you interfering with the good work that we're doing. And too many cooks have gathered no moss. I'm sorry to hear about your wife. The only thing I can advise is to try and keep a stiff upper chin. Everyone knows that the ward manager was done in by the patient with the paperweight. Although he has a brain the size of a grape and can't take responsibility, we do need to make sure we have all our P's and Q's crossed before we take him into custody. He scratched the deceased on her neck when she gave him his medication. He was then found standing over her holding the murder weapon. So when you boil it down to its nuts and bolts, it really isn't rocket surgery. So I don't want you stepping on anyone else's thunder. And if you interfere in any way, you'll be skating on hot water. We'll be watching you with a fine tooth comb from now on. Do you follow where I'm coming from? And then, um, yeah, and that's all, all the characters really. Uh, and so before we get into the, uh, the Q&A uh, and the closing bit, it's probably worth mentioning how the training actually went. So the number crunching is, um, we, this was based on the, the first few sessions, which involved uh, about 280 uh, participants and about 255 or so that returned the questionnaires that we, uh, that we gave them. So there's about 25 or so didn't. So they might have hated it. We don't know. 100% um, of the, the participants felt the training to be very helpful or helpful. I'm aware that's an almost Putin-esque uh, statistic but it is what it is. 99% rated it as excellent or good. 93% uh, would recommend the training to a colleague. 94% uh, would recommend the show to a friend which would indicate they slightly preferred the show to the training. Um, uh, this, this bit's really important I think. When asked if they felt more confident about reporting concerns after participating in the training, 52% answered much more, 31% answered slightly more and 12% answered no more, no less. I, I'm pleased to report that no one said I feel less confident in reporting uh, after, after seeing the show. Um, and uh, the, uh, the main themes uh, were, that really ran through uh, people's response is they felt more able to sort of talk to line managers. And, and now in the wake of the Francis report in the UK, each National Health Service Trust has what they call a freedom to speak up guardian, whose, whose, whose role is specifically to support people who raise concerns um, and, uh, and things like that. So uh, the last thing, before we get into any questions you might have, is I'm going to give you the closing bit of the show. Um, just the last, you know, just the, again, the opening bit will give you the, the after all the dust. And the, um, the closing bit is narrated by Dean, the nurse, who's, who's not the sharpest tool in the box, but he's got a good heart. Um, and um, this is him. Well, as the years went by, all the rumors spread about how I solved those murders. It's not gone to my head. I'm the ward manager now. All the staff think I'm great because I'm less like a boss and 
more like a socially inappropriate mate. All the patients from back then are dead now, except Molly, who no longer says all day, all day. She just rocks quietly in her own gentle way. And uh, there seems to be a, a situation with Horace, one of our newer patients. It started when Molly fell over and Horace helped her off the floor. And it was as if they'd never met before. He helped her into the lounge and they sat together and they couldn't take their eyes off each other. A few days later, they did it again. And now they do it all the time. Neither of them have got any kind of memory. So every time they meet, it's love at first sight. Sometimes they hold hands. Sometimes they actually kiss. One day, they were full-on snogging, but we pretended not to notice. Maybe love does conquer all. We just don't know why or when. They enjoy each moment for what it is. It's all sort of zen. And although Molly's mind can't memorise, she doesn't really have to, because you can see it in her eyes. And every day they meet and fall in love all over again. Are you here all day? Marvellous. There you go. That's, uh, that's that. Uh, so I think at this point, uh, me and Gail, we, we feel questions, if, if you have any. <clears throat> if you yes. don't. Ex absolutely, oh. Rob. Thank you. That was just marvelous. <laughs> what a beautiful story. And, and I love how that ends in terms of them falling in love over and over every day. How, how, how beautiful. And, uh, and how wonderful you've created this show. It shows such compassion and to teach people the compassion and, and remind us that, you know, there's a huge emotional landscape and the people are inside there that just somehow can't express themselves or remember the things that, you know, we all wish we could. Thank you. So it's, it's fantastic. And, um, and also the, based on, you know, the themes of compassion and, and, and the reporting concerns, um, I know we gave our producers at the start of the show some links um, that talk about and they may may um, be may be able to post them some uh, links that tell about the reporting and how that has changed um, in the UK, and then also I had found a link and I can post it right now of um, of one in the in the US. I know there's a whistleblowing uh, with the National Nurses United whistleblower protection. Uh, so I'm sure there's more than one, but um, it's just one I happen to look up and, and people can also see what, what you've done in the UK. We have lots to talk about, but I just want to take a moment to remind the audience that posted in the chat is the tip jar and that your tax deductible support is appreciated and indeed needed to keep the Marstream platform available to our communities during this time of isolation and theater closure. Um, and, and then, of course, we encourage your comments and your questions. Um, our Zoom audience can post in the chat. And to our YouTube audience, you can also post questions. And our producers, um, Brianna and Kristen, will help us keep an eye on that. So we'll, we'll try to get to whatever um, comments and questions you, you offer and, and uh, appreciate that very much. And Rob, um, so so you, you deliver workshops in, in comedy, creative writing, improvisation, and poetry, both inpatient and community settings. So, um, uh, and, and you have inpatient areas that include general and acute psychiatry, children and adolescent mental health services, psychiatric intensive care, rehabilitation and ongoing care, forensic services, eating disorder services, and on older people. So, um, that is a wide range of amazing good work. Yeah, it's, I mean, I like, um, <clears throat> I like, I like doing these workshops because for me, I've always had two parts of myself. I suppose quite a few people who work in the creative industries have, uh, have whatever their straight job might have been and then their, their creative occupation. So for me, there's a part of me that thinks as a, as a nurse and I'm very much programmed as a mental health nurse. I've worked in mental health since I was 17, so hey 
three years. Uh, but also there's a part of me that thinks as a, as a performer and as a comic and as a poet. Um, and so when I'm leading those sessions with people receiving mental health treatment, it's where the, the creative part of me and the clinical part of me just marry in a really, in quite a content sort of way. And I suppose when, when, you, when you're a creative practitioner and you're leading participatory workshops with people, one of your challenges is to really give them the best experience that you can. And so whether you're working with, on a, say, an eating disorder inpatient setting, where quite a few of the participants will be actually academically quite gifted and have sort of fairly perfectionist personality traits to say a, a, a dementia setting you, you, your challenge as an artist is to give these sets of people both the most fantastic experience possible so so i really enjoy it yeah oh that's fantastic we have a um a question here from ann um Wern, wormeyer i'm sorry if i'm not seeing that properly um did you fall in love while doing your research uh <laughs> no well i, I suppose <laughs> If I did, it would be a coincidence, <laughs> and I've got really no threshold for locking people. Uh, no, I suppose um, the the research for the show, the, the, you know, have to sort of burst any bubbles. There wasn't any, you know. Um, the, it was my starting point was to write down all the things I could remember from my experience of the dementia environment that I worked in as a student nurse, uh, and. Uh, and then, and then also, I had to learn a lot about how to write a who'd done it. Um, I didn't, I didn't fall in love, but I did, I did have a hero who's a local crime writer, a fellow called Rod Duncan, and he writes crime novels. And and he very kindly just gave me some mental mentorship. I just bought him a pint, and he, he gave me, and he gave me some really helpful advice. He said, he, he just said, first of all, you can't use coincidence to resolve anything with a murder mystery because it'll be cheating. You know, you can use a coincidence to set a plot in motion, but you can't use it to resolve a plot because it's unforgivable. You know, they'll see through it. Um, and, uh, and also, as I think the reason that the show works as a murder mystery is, and I know this, the research I did do was in the interval, performing it at generic theatre venues, was in the interval asking audience members who they thought the murderer was. Because you know when you're doing a whodunit, it feels like you're on stage screaming the identity of the murderer at them for, for an hour. And I'm pleased to report uh, less than a 20% hit rate of people successfully getting the ah, murder. Ah, good uh, and, Which is really reassuring. Um, and that was because of Rod, give, you know, suggesting the most perfect red herring, which really, you know, which really makes me very happy indeed. Um, and then, and, and I suppose what, what has happened, um, and what's been really nice is that this show does, in pre-COVID times, this show would do a lot of rural touring. So touring little villages out the way, kind of hamlets and places like, like village halls and libraries and stuff. And so you, you, a lot of older people would go to the show and you would meet a lot of carers and, and, and a lot of people yeah, who, caregivers. Uh, have got the most extraordinary sense of humour uh, about their experiences. And I'm, I might have fallen in love with each of them a little bit. Not in a creepy way. Uh, but, yeah. <laughs> Lovely. Um, what, someone asks uh, Lynn Schneider, how do you use comedy to help dementia patients? That's, uh, oh, that's a lovely question. Yeah, so what I've worked, what I've found, my, I've discovered the default thing, because obviously you, you're really struggling to, um, to do that because uh, of, well, the obvious difficulty with people's memory impairment. Um, what I've worked really well, uh, found works really well with them. There's a bit of trial and error. There's a lot of things that failed in the early days, but um, it's the group poem. So basically the group poem, it's me with a flip chart um, and I'm frantically writing the poem while everyone in the room shouts at me. Um, and so, so, so you, you'll think of the idea of whatever it's going to be about. Um, and then people just suggest things and I write the poem in real time based on people's suggestions. Um, the poem will usually be funny, uh, not always, sometimes you'll write something, it will get you take an unexpected sombre turn, it depends on how the conversation's going. Uh, but what I really like about the group poem is that it's, it's great for a mixed ability room. Um, mm -hmm. I started off doing it um, in schools 
for people with learning difficulties. Um, and, and, but it works equally well in any kind of setting. And the reason it works for people with memory impairment or, 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 um, or other difficulties is you can engage as much as little as you like. So supposing you're on a, an acute ward and you've, you're, you've, got, you've got mood elevation, you're hypermanic, you can just splurge out and you, you, you'll dominate half the poem as I'm writing as we go. But if, if conversely you just look up and go bibble, that will go in the poem. That will make its way into the poem. So whatever you contribute will find a way of going into the poem. If you're, if you're academically quite bright, you'll, you'll be going over the flip chart, the things I've written, correcting my grammar as, as I'm writing it, you know. Um, so it, so it's, it's a really nice way of just engaging people. Mm -hmm. And on the dementia wards, um, often the poem can be really used as quite a nice way of reminiscence as well. So, um, so one subject might have been, these are the jobs we worked. And, and each person gets a verse about the jobs they used to do and whether they hated it or liked oh, it. Or, or, or things that make me happy. That's quite a nice one. Because uh, often like list poems are great, I think. They're really easy to write. Audiences love them. Um, and, and sometimes poetry aficionados sneer at them a little bit. But <laughs> Um, and, and, and so, you know, things that make me happy. It's a lovely list poem because people, you can say, right, Frank, what makes you happy? Great, all right, you know, and it will go in, and it, you know, or, you know, um, Great way to it, one is naughty things I did as a kid, you know, things that I did as a kid that I should have really told myself off for. And that's a lovely one, you know, and uh, so it, 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 you know, that's, and so in terms of gauging people with memory impairment with, comedy for me the thing that i found most successful is the group poem because it, you, you just find out it's really nice for the staff as well because they get to find out more about their patients other than just their symptoms you know they actually get to see more about the the human being that, that mm -hmm. this person be, and that's brilliant that's really yes it creates community and people get to know one another it's it, it's really really a wonderful idea we have um a, a uh a comment here are dementia patients better off in a ward than at home with the family. My wife and I had a very tough time caring for her mother in the last years of her Alzheimer's. Would she be better off in the hands of a trained professional such as you? Um, I'm not qualified to answer the question really. I'm, I'm sorry, because again, I wouldn't know enough about your, your family or your experience to give a, a, an answer that you should take seriously. And again, the, there's so many moving parts involved with that kind of scenario it's really impossible to give any kind of yes or no thing we do know that um that whenever people are taken to an inpatient environment whether it's a care home or whether it's a hospital long-term setting we do know that it's very common for the people that have been caring for them for a long time to experience all sorts of guilt um, about perceptions of letting them down and that and that kind of thing and that's really difficult people for people we we also know that for very understandable and fairly obvious reasons, it's common for people to deteriorate when they're taken out of their home. Because of course, when you do have profound memory impairment, if you've lived in your home for a long time, then there's things around there that are familiar for you. You know where everything is. You know, you know what everything does, you know, to, to lesser degrees as time goes on. So the ideal, I suppose, generally speaking, the ideal would always be to for people to stay in their homes for as long as it's it's safe practical and and not overly emotionally exhausting for for the people that live with them we also know from a cold hard cash point of view that it's cheaper to care for people at home than it is in hospital um and so and, and so i suppose everything so the, ideally you want people to stay at home for as long as possible. But, but again, there's so many moving Yes, parts. there's a lot of factors involved there. You, um, you also are the lead artist for the Comedy Asylum, comedy shows created and performed by people receiving mental health treatment. And for 13 or 15 years now, these shows have culminated in the annual comedy extravaganza as part of the Leicester Comedy Festival. So um, we have, um, if, if Kristen uh, would play it, we have a, a short video that to show about the asylum. 
Bright Sparks Comedy Group. We're here tonight at the Guildhall as part of the Bright Sparks Comedy and Asylum, which is a show as part of the Comedy Festival. Yeah. Um, I snagged my jumper in Kuala Lumpur, and the further I travelled, the more it unravelled. <laughs> By the time I got to Istanbul, all I had was a ball of wool. But I did not care, because it was up there. It's, it's all been put together by Tim Sayers and Rob G. Um, we've been doing workshops for 12 weeks now, and this is the performance day. And we're now doing the rehearsals. It's all going well. Two years ago, I first came up with the idea of putting together a, a comedy show. Initially, we started with just... I think we just did an open mic. Uh, Bright Sparks is for people in, that have had mental health issues. Well, Bright Sparks is basically uh, an arts group uh, revolving around mental health problems. Yes. And we, we do poetry, we do murals, we do art. Um, we go and showcase what we do. And, and basically we show the positive side to mental health. We show that service users have many talents. This is the first time I've performed with them in a public place. And... Very nervous about well, it. The advert just said ground floor flat, so I went to look around, and sure enough, the floor was flat. <laughs> and it was on the ground. <laughs> We just wanted to show the audience a little bit about what it's all about, and um, and it's fantastic. You and who was the other gentleman that began it back? Oh, Tim, yeah. So Tim is a... he At the time of that video uh, so 11 years ago he was a community mental health nurse and uh, now he's the arts and health coordinator for the the health service trust where i live um and so he set up an organization called bright sparks and, and then the comedy asylum and it came from a thing when he was a community nurse that a lot of his uh, a lot of his clientele um were they'd done all this art they've done poetry they've done visual art they've done all this stuff and but they were really into comedy Leicester where I live has got a disproportionate amount of comedy we've got a comedy festival it's one of the biggest in Europe uh, and we're not a massive city it's about 350,000 people uh, but we have a really big comedy festival so so comedy is really quite big in Leicester and so a lot of the people they really wanted to have a go at comedy and, and at the time I was doing the clubs I was working the clubs so uh, he says oh I know somebody used to be a nurse let's just get him in um, and it came from that and it's great because um, it's a great confidence boost for people to sort of go up in sure. a room of, in front of an audience and just make them laugh. It's really quite empowering, I think. Yeah, um, in addition, you run a six-week course on the value of comedy and recovery from mental distress. Yeah, six-week closed group, uh, which is a lot of fun. And so, again, that's for people receiving mental health treatment. And it's a course in, uh, in the, the Recovery College, which is colleges specifically for people. Um, I'm recovering from a mental health episode um, and, um, and and that's a lot of fun so one week we'll, we'll do a bit of improv one week we'll do creative writing one week we'll do sketch comedy um, sketch comedy is really good for teamwork skills cooperation skills listening skills all of that kind of business and then we sort of pull together how these things can help recovery um, uh, and so, yeah, that's a lot of fun as well. Yeah, so you had it, said, um, you know, you, you had pointed out um, before that, that social isolation can increase the risk of relapse. So you're all about reducing social isolation and that you really had to up your game during the pandemic. Yeah. So, I mean, of course, that's been really difficult because we know that the next pandemic coming is going to be man mental health, you know, in, in the wake of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and we've uh, a lot of we it should be said as well that we deliberately target our what we do for people who have a label of quote unquote severe and enduring mental illness um so often these are people that are quite socially isolated lots of them don't even have the internet um and so when when covid happened and when we went into lockdown our challenge is how can we support these people through artistic endeavors so 
we set up a thing called remote art and so there are several there are several of our people who ring me on a regular basis um purely to for me to help with material that they're working on so one thing we don't do is in, is is interfere with people's mental health care plans or treatment um, that we're an arts organization but we we work with people receiving mental health treatment and and so anyone writing a poem or a comedy sketch or or anything like that we you know they they contact us and we we help them do it and then at the moment in the uk i mean leicester where i live has been a bit of a covid hotspot um so we've been in lockdown for just over 200 days now one form it's used a little bit but at the moment we're only allowed to meet uh outdoors in groups of up to six people if we don't oh, sure. live, um, and um, unless we're in a school, uh, so we 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 hired a school, um, and but again, it's uh, we we're doing what we call micro workshops with up to six participants at a time, and just just trying to give everyone as as much. And people are really enjoying it because you're know, normally a comedy assigned session will have about 18, 20 people in it, but there's only six of us. You get a lot more. You have a lot more input if you, if you know mm -hmm. what I mean. Um, so we're doing micro workshops now as well, and it, and again, it's you know we're we're all wearing masks throughout the workshop. We're you know hand sanitized. We're all socially distanced. So it brings its own challenges, but at least we get to hang out, and, and yeah. at least we get to work on comedy. And and we we don't know when the next show will be, but we are we are writing it. You know. And, yeah. Well, I applaud your work. It's just fabulous. I know you have the mental health poetry jukebox and well-being for healthcare workers. You 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 have a lot of different. Um, uh, I don't want to say shows. I guess as much as um, workshops and and yeah. uh, stuff going on. Stuff going on. <laughs> yes. Is there anything um, particular uh, as the time is? flying by as always is there anything else that you wanted to um tell us about um i think you know it is these things it's always like a job interview isn't it so you leave and afterwards you go oh i wish i mentioned blah, you know whatever it is uh, there's, <laughs> there's nothing that automatically springs to mind uh just to say to to people that um it's uh, if, if you want to know more about just stuff to, and it, you know just to make just to steal an idea and go with it at your end and see if it works then it's perfectly acceptable to drop me a line and say hi and um and i'll, I'll do what i can to help uh, you know um and yeah i think i just thanks for having me I've really enjoyed oh it. rob g it's been a real pleasure to have you on and um i will encourage that people can go to your website you can see quite a bit of information um of the good work that he does in mental health and also as a as a comic and a poet and um, I just want to say a very special thank you to you for tonight's featured presentation, Forget Me Not and Alzheimer's Who Done It. And you can look for uh, Rob G's show and more on his website and on our Marstream YouTube platform. And, um, and tomorrow night, I want to remind people, don't miss the Marstream International Solo Festival. Um, the Solo Festival was just October 7th through 11th. Uh, the awards with Stephanie is tomorrow. And there's still time to get tickets with your choice of over 50 shows just for a small fee available live through this Sunday, October 18th. And then this show you'll be able to see cashed on our Solo, solo Arts Heal page. I want to tell you about next week. You're going to love Robin Gelfenbein, known for her Wienermobile show about bullying. Robin is coming to us with a new show, The Human Connector, in which she brings a flight of passengers together in the most unexpected way that helped her fight the loneliness and isolation of COVID, something we were all experiencing. The self-proclaimed uh, ambassador of fun and New York City-based storyteller, writer, and comedian, Robert Gelfenbein is a three-time Moth Story Slam winner who has performed on PBS, shared the stage with Trevor Noah, and more. She's the creator and host of the storytelling series and podcast, Yum's the Word, that features her homemade ice cream cakes, <laughs> as featured on CBS Sunday Morning and elsewhere. And her, but her critically acclaimed solo show, My Salvation Has a First Name, A Wienermobile Journey, premiered at the New York International Fringe Festival and New York Magazine called it the highlight of the fringe. She's currently working on a memoir and screenplay about how the Wienermobile saved her life. So um, that'll be next week. Let's always have um, 
uh, wonderful performers as tonight. Again, thank you, Rob G. And to our Zoom and YouTube audiences, um, Marstream producers extraordinaire, Brianna and Kristen, and to artistic director, Stephanie Wiseman. We're all in this together. We'll see you tomorrow for the International Solo Fest Awards. And again, next week on Solar Arts Heal. Thank you and good night, everyone. <laughs>